name sounds familiar. It's familiar. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody. We're going to get started. This is lovely. So good evening. My name is Jen Wesson. I'm one of the co-founders of Women of the Row. Thank you for joining uh, the fellow Women of the Row and friends to learn more uh, about policies surrounding transgender participation in sports. So we all know, right, that sports in high school and college changes the trajectory of uh, a woman's life. And two weeks ago, we came together as a group to celebrate the 50th anniversary. It was great to see some of you there, um, uh, anniversary of Title IX. Um, and we know that total, Title IX looked to grow the opportunities for women. Um, we talked about the successes of the policy, but we also acknowledged that there um, was still plenty of work to be done. Um, Women of the Row and UBC member and champion rower Ann Cutler uh, spoke briefly about educating ourselves on this very topic that we're going to um, hear about tonight. Women of the Row, um, it, our mission uh, is really to be thoughtful and action oriented. Um, and more than ever, you know, sport is a way to create connectivity and, and inclusion. So our, our goal this evening is just to bring a timely subject into conversation um, and to give folks resources for where they may learn more about um, um, you know, what's happening with policy and how that is gonna affect the future of women in sport. So before we get started, just very briefly, um, I some housekeeping items. I've muted everyone to eliminate any type of background noise. Um, you have the ability to unmute yourself at any time though. So just be reminded that any background noise will prevent others from being able to hear the speaker. So just be cautious of that. Um, I encourage you to keep your chat room visible and off to the side and use the chat room to ask questions um, or make comments. Um, or we'll try to feed um, um, Nikki our, or Nancy our, um, uh, the questions as we go through the evening. Um, we will be displaying a presentation, so it'll take over your screen. You don't have to do anything. Uh, once we take the presentation down, your screen will return the way it was. And lastly, I just want everyone to be aware that we are recording this session, so it's available to those that cannot join us tonight, and also available for you to share with others um, in your clubs, friends, family. Um, the more, you know, the better. So thank you again for being here. Um, you know, I think just as uh, the, you know, we are better as we move forward together. So uh, I really, I really thank you for being here and, and learning more about this subject. So without further hesitation, I'm going to go ahead and ask Ann Cutler to provide a little introduction to our, our topic this, this evening and introduce um, our fantastic speaker. Ann? Hey, it's great to see everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um... If you know me really well, you know that I've been, I'm 63 and I've been competing since I've been three. And my mother um, was a semi-pro baseball and basketball player in the 40s. So for me, you know, athletics has always been an avenue for personal challenge and for opportunity. And I have, uh, you know, I stand on the shoulders of people like my mother, people like Carol Oglesby, who I studied under, you know, in graduate school. And, um, you know, when I went to GW and rode there, um, the people really took care of me in the athletic department, which then was the AIAW. But I've continued through my life to, um, with the positions that I hold here in Camden County and otherwise, um, to give back to give back so that women, other women have the same opportunities that I have had. And that's why I stay on top of the issues as much as I can and make sure that we preserve, you know, title, you know, we celebrated Title IX, you know, two weeks ago. And when I spoke, you know, I was just like, we, we have to continue to make sure that that provides the opportunities for us, right? Um, on an even playing field. And I remember um, a friend of mine, Christine Brennan, who is a journalist um, for CN, I guess CNN. I don't know where she is right now, but when I was in Washington, I had the opportunity to meet her on multiple occasions. And her, you know, her stance was, you know, we always have to watch out for Title IX because it's one legislative action away from being taken away. Um, and the reality is if we did not have the separation and the protection 
um, for girls sports and boys, girls and women's sports and boys sports. You know, if we did not have those separate categories, there would be no women participating on the Olympic and the, and the world championship level. Um, it just would not happen. So, and they, we would not have the opportunities. Um, so that's why I'm here tonight. And I want to introduce my friend and colleague, um, who uh, Nancy Hogshead Makar, who I met through the Women's Sports Foundation a while ago. She's been a shero of mine because of the way that uh, not only is she an accomplished athlete, I think she's got three gold medals and a silver um, from 1984 in Olympics and swimming, but she has devoted her life um, to advocating and writing um, on Title IX and equality and equal opportunity for women and advocacy in um, sexual abuse cases, et cetera. And she started this group called Champion Women, which I think is, is, is a tremendous thing. But Nancy is, she's out there on the forefront. She has, um, her contributions have positively affected all of us women and will continue to be. Um, she's really gifted and I'm proud to call her my friend. And I am going to pass the baton to her for a little presentation um, to discuss uh, the issue on, which is particularly, um, I was brought into it a couple of months ago with uh, the Penn swimmer, Leah Thomas. And I've sat in on multiple conversations with rowers and the rowing community and the swimming community and other people, you know, about this topic. And um, I'm not gonna say where I stand right now, but I've looked at the facts, I've looked at the research, and I, I just want to share that with others through Nancy. So Nancy, pass the baton, it's all yours. You might wanna go off mute, go off mute. Okay, you think I'd know by now after, you know, three years of, of uh, being on Zoom. So Lynn, or Anne, that was such a nice introduction. Thank you very much, yeah. I'm um, I'm really lucky to get to have the life that I do and uh, and the opportunities that I do to be able to be an advocate. Um, all right, I'm going to share my screen with you all. So <clears throat> um, I just want to say before we kind of get formally started in this, um, there are two areas that Champion Women does that are gonna intersect. One is our all of our work that we do showing how women are nowhere near equal opportunities, equal treatment or equal scholarship dollars. And it's actually kind of pathetic when we, we get there, how bad it is. And I'm gonna ask for your help in that area, but how that intersects, if you will, with the transgender issue. And um, so, and I, I think that'll become apparent. Um, I may say something that is not quite right. I might mispronounce or uh, misgender somebody, but I promise you that I'm not coming from a place of trying to hate transgender people or hate cisgender people or um, I'm, I'm really not, I, um, I really want the best, you know, I've been a women's sports advocate and I continue to be a women's sports advocate. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to give you all this PowerPoint. So like, you don't need to take pictures or anything. <laughs> and, uh, I've got my, my, uh, emails right there. If you need to get in touch with me. Um, so what, what does champion women do? We do three major projects. I already told you about two of them ending sex discrimination in college and high school athletic departments, as well as the transgender issue. But we also do a lot in the issue in the area of sexual harassment and abuse. Um, Champion Women was a major leader in getting two major pieces of legislation changed in the, for, to the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. We, um, so we, we, uh, we wrote the NCAA's pregnancy and parenting guidelines. Coaches were telling athletes they had to get an abortion or they were not going to be able to be on the team. Or alternatively, if you have an abortion, you're going to lose your scholarship. And uh, of course, that's <clears throat> kind of up in the air right now. 
But anyway, so any so we do the intersection, if you will, of misogyny, sexism, and sport. Bing. When those two things interact, that's us. So um, here's, this is like my, I call it my believe me slide. <laughs> okay, so I wrote uh, this book called Title IX and Social Change, and it goes over the history of Title IX. And I wrote it with Andy Zimblis. He's an economist, I'm a lawyer. And so between the two of us, um, we sort of covered all the different branches of government over time and like how it went from AIW to the NCAA and um and, uh and you know what the what the public was going through at the same time so just like you I'm also an athlete um i'm probably not as active an athlete as you all are right now um i was just texting my brother and he's like oh my gosh you're talking so my brother rode at harvard from 1978 to 1984 and or, or i'm sorry 1982 that would be a long time to graduate and um, and I need to get my dog to be calm. There you go. And um, uh, and so I told him I was talking to you all, and he was all really excited. Um, so um, as a civil rights attorney, I thought when I was in law school that that Title IX, the athletics part of it, the first part I'm going to go over tonight, was going to be over because frankly, it's a little boring. You just count, like, what are you doing for the men? What are you doing for the women? It's not rocket science. And if I had to do my career over again, I'm, I just turned 60. And so I figure I've got 10 more years of uh, this work. I would have been more focused on making sure that Title IX was actually happening and probably a less time making sure that women had the right to be able to exercise equality, okay? Um, I'll talk about that in a second. So like I write a lot and, and I'm a expert litigation and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So, um, oh yeah, 2020, I was named as title nines, the unrelenting, my husband would agree. <laughs> okay. So sex discrimination, where are we in athletics? We have a website that I'm going to put into the chat, which is, um, it's, it's called um, title9schools.com, T-I-T-L-E-I-X schools.com. And we go through all 2000 schools. We take the data from the Equity and Athletics Disclosure Act. So this is data that's coming from the schools themselves. It didn't come from us. And um, if you look at that data, um, women should be getting another actually now it's actually a little bit worse it is uh it's almost 200,000 right now but it's 100 it, this was what it was a year ago and um we're, we just cracked the billion dollar mark in college scholarships a billion dollars for those of you that got college scholarships just remember how life changing that was for you it certainly was for me even though I come, my parents absolutely would have made sure that I was going to go to college. Um, um, the sense of empowerment that that gave me was almost as important as an Olympic gold medal. That having a scholarship, uh, like I earned something really important, really valuable. And then one of the ways that you measure whether or not schools are providing equal uh, treatment of athletes is recruiting dollars. And this is a way that we can measure recruiting dollars. Women should be, women's programs should be getting another $162 million. So if sex discrimination was evenly distributed through schools, it's not. But hypothetically, if it was, every single school in the United States would have to add almost four new teams, assuming that teams are 25 athletes. So like we know some sports like rowing are bigger, some sports like tennis, golf, swimming are less than 25, right? But so if, an, if it's an average of 25, schools would need to add Every single school would need to add a hundred more athletes or twenty or four new teams. Um, um, all right. So, how bad is the problem? I've been giving this this talk about you know how women's sports are growing. 
literally for the last 30 years. It's kind of embarrassing. But what I wasn't doing that now we are doing is we were only looking at the gray line, which is women's participation, like the raw numbers. And then we were looking at the blue line, which is men's participation numbers. But when you go to college, there's so many more women who are in college that as a, if one in 10 men has an opportunity to participate in sports and one in 10 women has an opportunity to partic participate in sports, it should be this fuchsia line, right? The, the color of my office, my shirt, right? It should be this line up here. So this is the true participation gap. So all these years I've been saying, well, you know, and I, like I always, I had things like notice, like the lines never do this. They never come together throughout the whole history of Title IX. So women's opportunities have never come at the expense of men. Not that that is bad, right? I have to say I have three children and my when, when my twin daughters were born, my son lost opportunities. <laughs> he lost lap time. He lost... Uh, I, I didn't take as long to put him to bed at night, um, but it wasn't that he was being discriminated against. He just had to share opportunity. He had to share family resources with his twin sisters, right? So, but I would always like point out how that, that never happens and, you know, how stable the, the graph is, particularly after the year 2000. That was after uh, Bill Clinton was in office. He's the last uh, president that really spent presidential slash political capital on making sure women had opportunities in sports. Um, later on this week, myself with Alistair Casey, he's our C he's COO, and we're meeting with uh, um, the uh, General Accounting Office for the government, and they're looking at these numbers and looking at the numbers that these numbers tell. Since, uh, just since Mark Emmert, I understand that he's leaving very, very shortly. It cannot be soon enough, but he was doing what the presidents wanted him to do. And what they wanted him to do was ignore Title IX. That's exactly what he did. So during his tenure, the gap between men's and women's sports grew by 20, 20 we're now at 28%. So COVID through the whole thing, right? He's, it's, it just keeps getting worse. Um, <clears throat> um, okay, so this is a tough slide to see. I hope you all have big screens, but this is the ACC and I bring it up because this, it includes my university, Duke University, and I always feel like I should be telling on myself, right? If like, if I'm, because if I just like ask you all, like, where'd you go to school? And then we have those numbers up there, like people kind of feel personally affront, right? Because we're, we look at our school as such a community and such a, a belonging. Um, so I put up my school, my conference, you know, Duke University here. And I want you to see that this is the rich schools. The ACC and the SEC are two of the richest schools and they need to add, just one conference needs to add 40 Five million dollars. They need to add 1,500 opportunities for women's sports. They um, and they need to add 18 million for uh, uh, scholars for uh, um, uh, recruiting dollars. So this does not include how much you're spending on facilities and locker rooms and uh, how much you're paying the coach. Are you paying, are you getting women equal quality coaches that you're providing to the male athletes, right? So you can see this is not a happy picture. And one of the things that we were doing in preparation for uh, June 29th is, is making sure that these numbers got out. We worked with the, um, University of um, Maryland, and they did phenomenal research and put out some really great graphics um, on, you know, what's happening, but just to try to do whatever we can to get the story out there. Okay, so this is, um, again, I want to say measuring is actually kind of dull, <laughs> and that uh, um, these were my daughters when they first started um, playing softball, and they went to their third practice. Here they are, age seven years old. And they said, hey, mom, how come the boys have a scoreboard and we don't have a scoreboard? Why do they have bathrooms and we don't? Why do they have dugouts 
and we just have a bench that's on the ground. So this age, they know, and it, for all of you all that either have children or work with children, you know that their like antenna for fairness is pretty well tuned in by, <laughs> by this age. So when, when uh, Alistair and I talk to current students about bringing actions against their school so they can get the whole school in, in compliance, and we go over the data for their school, and it almost never fails that as soon as we go over the law and the facts in their case, it is silence on the other end. Like they don't know what to say. I mean, because they've always known that they were being discriminated against, but they assume there must be some reason, right? That there must be, you know, some explanation that they just don't know about. Maybe it's football making money or maybe it's whatever it is, else it is. But we're, you know, when we go through what the defenses are, there is no, no defense to sex discrimination in sport, They're right? It doesn't matter how much money the football program makes or a donor who just wants to give it to the baseball team or to the men's rowing team or, right, we go over what all the defenses are. There are no defenses. You, a school, if they receive federal funds, no matter how they get it, they have to agree to treat men and women equally in all educational programs or activities. Sports is an activity, you're not invited. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, so um, it, it's covered under Title IX. They have to provide equality. So we need to like energize current women and you all as women who are say, you know, over the age of 25 can really help them in letting them know that, you know, they're not gonna lose community, that it's okay to really stand out and stand up for women's rights. Okay, hold on. <clears throat> um, so we go over like how every lawsuit, I know there's a lot of lawyers on the group, but every lawsuit just asks like, what are the facts? What is the law? If you're talking about a car accident case, determining what the facts are can be really tough. Um, was the light red or green, right? So you might have some witnesses here, right? And then the fact finder, either a judge or a jury will say the light was red and like, that that is a question of fact. And then the jury uh, determines it. You're not invited. Stop. So um, <clears throat> um, when it comes to Title IX, we've got 50 years of the law. So that's pretty settled. Defense lawyers are always coming up with, you know, new reasons on why they don't have to provide equality. But basically, it's pretty settled law. And the facts are, right, if you have a sexual harassment claim, it's is uh, or an employment claim where somebody doesn't get hired or they don't get promoted. Those are tough claims and they put a lot of emphasis on the plaintiff, right? They've got to work really hard. Not so with these cases. They ask very little of the athletes that are um, that are coming forward. OK, so I'm going to scoot here to. Um, uh, the, the, the law, and I think you guys have, have seen this before, <clears throat> but Title IX is, right, so we have, let me make sure I got this right. Yeah. Okay, this is the slide I wanted. Okay, so as you all know, three branches of government, go back to seventh grade. Um, I really don't mean to be talking down to you, so, <laughs> but, but, right, so Congress passes a statute Right, so we have a Title IX, the statute, and it says no person on the basis of sex. The law could have developed in sport to be exactly like the physics department. The physics department says there's one department and whoever makes it, makes it. But the athletics department said you have to create a whole new sports department. You've got to create a women's sports department. And they did so because of biology. Right. Can you all get that? Like the law didn't have to develop that way, that it developed that way because amazing women, amazing women had the foresight to make sure that the law required it was separate but equal. That is not a politically correct term to use separate but equal, but it describes sports perfectly. So 
after a statute gets passed, then it moves over here to the executive branch. It's the Department of Education. Back then it was health and human, something different. And, um, and then it goes to the, uh, the, the Office for Civil Rights and they come up with regulations on how it is that a recipient of funds would know if they were discriminating against women. And th those regulations are really clear and they say, equal means equal. So we have those and they specifically talk about having uh, formal sex segregation in sports. Now you'll notice that when it comes to, we almost have no formal segregation anywhere else in the entire school. We don't have, right? We, we almost never racially segregate, right? And we don't religiously segregate and we don't, right? But we do sex segregate in sport. And so number one is I want to sort of, oh God, kind of call your attention to that because this, that makes all the difference in the world is being able to have that sex segregation. And then we've got all this uh, in the judiciary here with uh, the courts and the case law and the case law specifically says essentially separate but equal. Okay, that you can have sex, formal sex segregations in athletic programs. All right. So um, any questions so far before, because that, that's kind of a key point is how the law developed and how, uh, how important it is that it developed in a way to allow for formal sex segregation. Any questions yet? Okay. Hearing none, here we go. So here's what I'm worried about. Here's what um, uh, other civil rights lawyers and so forth are worried about, which is the Biden administration. And uh, there's a statute that has made it through the house twice now. It's called the Equality Act. But what Bi the Biden administration wants to do through changing the regulations, which would um, make sex discrimination and gender identity of discrimination, the same thing, right? So that um, if, if bad outcome number one is that if sex discrimination does become gender identity discrimination, somebody who identifies as a woman but is biologically male could compete in the women's sports category. Okay, so they would have the right to be able to participate in the women's sports category. And, and unless it was blatantly unsafe, there would be very little ability to keep an athlete out. But a sport like probably rowing, swimming, track and field, sports where there's not contact, right? It's not like, you know, um, say basketball or in soccer, there's some hitting. Um, but, you know, some direct contact sport like, um, I don't know, wrestling, um, right, to not be able to keep somebody, they would not be able to keep them out of sport. You would not be able to have a women's sports category that would be specifically for females. When I say female, I'm referring to the biological category as opposed to an identity category. Um, all right, my second bad outcome here would be that a judge, that, okay, so imagine that this passes and that gender identity and sex discrimination are now the same thing. Now imagine that uh, people who are hostile to women's sports, we all know who they are, but let's just say the word football that they, uh, they don't like Title IX. Uh, athletic directors have never, you know, they, they barely say a good game, uh, but if some interests were to um, uh, um, to uh, bring a, a claim to say, um, Your Honor, we should have no opportunities. Um, w w I mean, uh, uh, we should not have formal sex segregation in sport. If it's not based on biology. I don't, I don't know how a judge affirms it. I don't know 
And I've asked lots and lots of other people and nobody has been able to say it. My, my expectation is that most um, schools would continue to have women's sports because it is culturally okay. But, you know, I was just talking to you about Champion Women's Project to make sure that women have the right to be able to demand equality with whatever men are getting, that we can do something about closing that gap, um, that, that they would not have the right to be able to do that. Right now, any athlete, uh, usually we get groups of athletes, can uh, file a, get a class action lawsuit against the school representing uh, the current students and future students that are going to be there. And, 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 and that is, as a lawyer, that's my biggest, biggest worry that I have. Um, uh, so, let's see. Um, so, <clears throat> um, W w there, uh, I, I had sent out earlier several YouTube um, uh, videos that talk about that talk that are directly from the horse's mouth of scientists. So I'm a lawyer, I'm not a scientist. I depend on the science of other people. Back 12 years ago, when the NCAA was considering having um, transgender inclusion in women's sports. What we were told was that the um, that uh, was that um, one year of gender affirming hormones would make somebody move laterally. They would move from the men's category into the women's category. And um, now, since twelve years ago, we now know that's just false. That. Uh, the bad news is there is no amount of gender affirming hormones that somebody can be on to make them be able to move laterally. They don't lose their strength and lung capacity and blah, blah, blah. They do lose VO2 max pretty quickly. And I know like swimming, that that's a big deal in rowing. And, um, but when it comes to uh, all these other metrics, I've actually gotten to be, for the first time in my entire life, a little bit jealous of some of the benefits <laughs> that being on testosterone for a decade gives somebody. Um, one of the things is it makes somebody's throat like 35 to 50% bigger. And, you know, as a swimmer, I was a butterflyer, right? So like, <gasps> like you have to breathe in really quickly, right? Your head, your head's up and down and up and down, right? And like, <sighs> I could have done so much with another 50% bigger throat to be able to do that. Oh, that would have been great. So, um, all right, so we cannot do that. We cannot make it fair for transgender athletes to participate in the girls and women's category. Can we, and, and Leah Thomas uh, was a transgender woman at Penn that uh, Ann and I talked about many, many times. So, um, her times and her results mirror exactly what the science would say. What the science says is that the longer the event, that the more that testosterone reduction works, if you will, okay? And the shorter the event, the less that it, was, that, that it would make a difference. Well, sure enough, in her time, so there, there are two ways to mathematically look at whether or not it's fair. And one is from a placing, from a ranking standpoint, um, swimming is crazy uh, objective materials. And so is it, is it, right? So do they move from being 500th to 500th? Um, you know, Leo went from being ranked 65th to being number one. 65th is, I don't, I don't know how to put it in rowing terms, but in swimming terms, so we have nationals and we have junior nationals. That person does not make junior nationals, right? That is a huge gap. There are 13,000 swimmers in the NCAA, but 
uh, you know, the, we, we say in sports, and this is usually true for almost all sports, which is the tail is long, right? So here's like 95% of all athletes, right? And this tail out here, right? So that the number, say one through three athletes look nothing like the top 10. And those top 10 look nothing like the top 25 and so forth, right? That, that it, the, the gaps in standard deviation get much, much bigger the further out on the tail that you go. So moving from 65th to first is unheard. It would never happen in a, in a uh, biological female, um, um, except maybe one time in that female's life when uh, they just go through puberty, that first time they could, but for a, uh, an athlete who did not, uh, uh, Leah Thomas did not change her coaching she did not change her equipment. She had the exact same teammates. She had, he didn't change, right, his approach to the sport, right? N nothing, right, for three years, competed uh, at Penn on the men's team and then transitioned to the women's team. So the, there's, there was, um, no, um, there's no other kind of change that would, that would mean something as to why they could make that change. Then two is you can look at what's the gap between men's and women's, say, national qualifying standard, right? And you can look at, and it's, it's remarkably consistent. There's always a bigger gap in the sprints and it's a smaller gap in the um, distance events. Um, and uh, whether you're talking about making NCAAs or making the junior nationals or making senior nationals or right, uh, making Olympic trial cuts, et cetera, right? The gaps are bigger in the sprints when you have a Caleb Dressel and then, right, it's, it's not, not as much in the longer events. And that's exactly what Leah's times did. Um, so Leah in, she should have, uh, moved back about 12% in the 100 meter freestyle. She moved back less than 1%. She should have moved back in the um, uh, in the uh, 200 meter freestyle. I want to say it was like 8%, and she moved back. I think it was like 3.8%. So, uh, and then the 500 freestyle, you know, about half as much. So science would have predicted that. Almost, almost to a T, like her results demonstrate exactly what the science would say about how much you can roll back. <clears throat> okay, so if we don't categorize by sex, like let's just say we've got a magic wand and we say we want to include transgender athletes and what's the best way to be able to make sure that people have opportunities in sports. And um, so first I want to say that you can have these theoretical debates, but nobody's really talking about it. Uh, and then second, there's no other physical criteria, no objective criteria that would enable somebody to be able to even have that conversation. So if you want to say, oh, well, we'll, we'll have just the tall people and then we'll have the less tall people. Well, you're going to have tall men and and not as tall men, and you do it by weight. Uh, you know, kind of like uh, the the weightlifters uh, who are the same weight at the Olympics. The men lift thirty percent more. So if you did it by weight, you would just have men doing it in different weight categories, um, matching leg length or wingspan. You would have men with really long wingspans, like Michael Phelps, and then you would have people men with less. Uh, big wingspans. Um, um, anyway, age or ability, some people have said, you know, Michael Phelps has this ability to remove lactic acid from his body. You know, even if we did it by that, again, you're all, you're just going to have all these male categories, typically between the ages of 20 to 30. So, and this is kind of, well, let me go through these slides before my, my big ta -da point, which is, um, these are two in, uh, in 2019, says so before the past Olympics, they, these were the two number one ranked athletes in the world, uh, for their event. <clears throat> and, um, they both had 
you know, the, the most amazing training. They're both, they're the same height, same wingspan, uh, same weight. And, you know, he's 10, 11% faster than she is. Um, so, uh, and, and, uh, <clears throat> I don't, I don't know how much, how often that rowers train side by side, but what it looks like when somebody is going, so you, you all see how Katie Ledecky wins and by these huge margins, right? You all know what an amazing swimmer she is. <clears throat> I'm unbelievably impressed. Anyway, so Katie Ledecky is only at most, at most 2% faster than all of her competitors, as opposed to the men in those same events are uh, are 10% faster than she is. 10% faster looks like if you're looking at a track meet and you know they've got those track competitions that are some uh, you know some it's a mixed relay and sometimes like you know the, the, they'll put it in a different order. And when you see men competing against women and you see like it, it looks like she's standing still. It's, it's remarkable just how amazing it is when you see it side by side. We typically don't see it, right? And that's why you've heard like people say like, oh, when they have the Olympics, they should have an average person stand next to them. Um, you know, if they, if they even had like a Katie Ledecky, it would just show you how, how much faster that the men are than the women. Uh, Here's another one. I've shared this slide on Twitter so many times. So Missy Franklin and Ryan Lochte, they are the same height. They are the same weight. They, had, they both had amazing training, coaching, facilities, right? They had it all. And um, they're both six foot two. They both have six foot four wingspan. They both held the world record in the 200 backstroke. And um, Ryan Lochte's half a length, half a lap, half a, half a lap of an Olympic size pool faster than Missy Franklin is. This is not to say that Missy is not an amazing athlete, right? It is to say that um, Missy, in order for her to be Missy Franklin, she needs her own category. So after showing you these last three sides, what I want you to take from that is that how sport gets diversity and inclusion is by creating categories. We have lots, as you all know, we have lots and lots of sport categories. Uh, rowing has by weight, uh, you have by age, you have uh, in the NCAA division one, two, three, you have uh, in a high school level in Florida, we have uh, a, a single A, double A, triple A, quadruple A, right? Depending on the size of the school, we have, right? There's so many ways that we categorize sports because otherwise you're never going to have a 120 pound winner, right? You're not going to, there's not going to be 140 pound. So if we want to give, biological women, half of, of, we want to give them an equal opportunity to be able to participate in sports and play sports. Um, if we want them to have prize money, to be able to win, to be able to know what that gold medal feels like, um, to even be able to be in the hunt, they need their own category. They need their own team. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm part of uh, Champion Women and me. I'm part of the Women's Sports Policy Working Group. And so we've worked long and hard. So a year ago, we thought it was possible for somebody to mitigate their sex linked advantage. So now science is very clear. You got, um, I've got lots and lots of resources, uh, lots of studies. They've been studying what happens with testosterone reduction because some men, when they get testicular cancer, they have to go off testosterone. So they've been studying this phenomena for a long time. This is not like, you know, oh, just with the new transgender athletes, like what, what happens to strength? What happens uh, with age and strength, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
And I want to point out that just how frankly sexist that the debate has been, because almost nobody is talking about transgender men, meaning biological women. So biological women who transition and they're now trans men will never be able to compete with the best men. Um, I competed <laughs> with women who were using steroids. So my years of being on the national team were 1976 to 1984. And during those years were major uh, drug use years by the East Germans. We competed against them. They had super low voices. You, well, I would go into the locker room and I thought it was like the cleaning staff that was in there. And I was like, I'm here. Right? And they were like, no, no, you know, it was just East German women. Um, so, I, and I really feel for them. They've had terrible uh, health and lives and pregnancies because of it. Um, and so, and I, um, and, and the East German women who were as doped up as could be were only like between like one, one and a half percent faster than we were. They were not remotely competitive in the men's category. So that's kind of how you know that this is sexist, that it's really, it's only about the, the advocacy has been to allow trans women, biological men, trans women to be able to compete in the women's category, like wherever they feel most comfortable. And we say that, that when it cannot be head-to-head -head competition, because it's not fair, then there are other ways of being able to include particularly transgender women. So we already know, like we already have lots of transgender men that are already competing in the women's category. So you all may have seen um, 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 uh, Isaac, uh, Isaac, uh, I think it's Herzog. Oh, I probably got that one wrong. But uh, right, but was uh, was a swimmer at Harvard who was who had a bilateral mastectomy, uh, but still competed on the women's team, did not go on steroids, did not go on testosterone, waited, uh, but stayed on the women's team. Uh, there was, there have been numerous athletes that have, that are either gender fluid or, right, but they <clears throat> continue to compete in the women's category. And so long as they don't take drugs, they don't take performance enhancing drugs, then everything's good to go. Uh, and that's how you know, like, it's not about expressing trans hate. I have no doubt whatsoever. There are some people that are using sport as the way to express trans hate, but wanting a place for women to have to participate and to be a part of sports <clears throat> is not it. Um, so there are some people that are doing that. That doesn't mean that the whole debate is that it, it right? I, I have very good um, credentials on the left. Uh, I've been a lifelong lefty. I'm actually married to a Republican, if you can believe it. I'm actually speaking in about a week to the Federalist Society. Um, but I want to have respectful debates with people or respectful discussions rather than having it be about like, oh, you think um, this, therefore you must be transphobic. You must be um, you know, anti-trans. It's just not true. So there are all kinds of ways for transgender athletes to participate in the social construct of sport particularly for swim, for sports like swimming and, and uh, um, uh, track and field, like we train together all the time, right? Typically there's in a pen, Leah Thomas has got the exact same teammates that she had before she transitioned, um, right? Same lanes, same, we, we share lanes, we share, we help each other stretch, we uh, lift weights to everything is together. I, in my career, <clears throat> I was never on an, a women's team that had a separate coach or was separate. The same way that those of you that like <clears throat> rode and had a separate, like the women's rowing team. I never had that. 
Um, so there are all these different, <laughs> different ways. <laughs> hey, can y'all come get the dogs? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <Hold on. clears throat> okay. Um, hold on. Let me just get the. You all can be memorizing the long list. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Hey, can you take the pops, please? Come on. Come on. Come on, Dutch. Come on. Come on. Come on, Dutch. Come on. Go, go, go. Good, good job. Sorry about that. Oh, so embarrassed. Okay. <laughs> it happens uh, all the time, even in the corporate oh world. <laughs> it's our new world, Nancy. <laughs> I know exactly. Um, so um, I, I did want to remind you all that um, there's a, a ton of research showing that girls that play sports do better in school than kids that don't play sports. And it's not just like an, an association. It's not like you all came from nice families and you were going to do well in school anyway. There is something that makes somebody out predict what they would have done anyway. So only sport as an after-school activity has this benefit. So being on the debate team or being on the, on the what else, uh, you know, the, the student government or the yearbook or something like that doesn't do it. Only women's sports makes people be in the workforce, stay in the workforce, get more education, uh, much less likely to get breast cancer or osteoporosis, which is half of all of us um, uh, after the age of 60. So uh, yeah, no, the, 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 what, what a sports experience means for somebody, they will make 6% more in their lifetime. 6% is a lot. They will, um, uh, they are 94% of the C-suite of women. So when you all encourage women to, um, to bring a lawsuit against their school, you're really, that's generations of women who are going to be impacted by that, by, by doing that. It's really, really important. Um, <clears throat> does Title IX, I'm going to send you these uh, uh, extra ones. <clears throat> I wish Title IX could keep schools from shrinking its athletic department. Um, <clears throat> but I want you to notice that in all of the sex discrimination that's going on in schools, okay, with all of this, that not once, not once have I ever heard a men's team say, oh, my goodness, look at all this discrimination you're facing here, take ours. And yet that is kind of what trans advocates are asking women to do is to say, here, take ours. You are more discriminated against than I am. So take this. Men, I've never once heard a men's team think that they should do that. Um, I think that's it. Oh, there's, I always have to have John Lewis. And uh, so talking about getting into some good trouble, some necessary trouble. All right. <clears throat> um, thanks somebody for putting up Title IX schools there. Um, all right, I'm ready. I'm, let's see, if you wanna see the science, please take 40 minutes, Ross Tucker, which Je yeah, Jen sent out, yeah. But he's great. He's uniquely good at explaining, right? So when I know a lot of you all like, you know, you're, for me, the decision follows science and it's the science that uh, convinced me. So do folks all right, have I know questions for, for Nancy? I, I just wanted to uh, make people aware of this tension, right? So, so it, it, you know, the debate is, again, we're not just, I, 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 am, I am an ally, I'm an LGBTQ ally, my whole life professionally trained in my corporation to be an ally, you know, but right. when, when it comes to, when I saw the research, you know, because I thought, well, maybe if they go on, you know, uh, 
the hormone suppressing whatever that it, they may come down and there may be there may be a chance that it just doesn't the research the scientific research doesn't hold hold water you know so the question is how how do you be inclusive and be fair i mean you can't do both right the, the choice needs to be made in every sport is going to have to make that choice um, on which side to fall, right? And, and I believe Nancy's group and, and my recommendation is to have a separate category is the only way to be inclusive and fair. And, and that is my position based on a lot of time listening and thinking and, and talking. Um, our sport, and I want to keep all the benefits for all our young girls, um, keep them going, the ones that we all benefited from. And I've been through the rowing since I was a pioneer in rowing. And believe I, me, you know, I've taken a lot of hits over my career a, as a rower. I've taken it as a, as a, as a referee. I mean, you just keep, you keep going. And I'm one that wants to keep it going. And, and right now, U.S. Rowing's position is one of inclusion. Right now, if, if, if a man identifies as a female, they are allowed to race in the women's races. So, you know, you have to make your own decision as to what that's going to mean. Um, even though U.S. Rowing has said, we know the biology is very clear, they want to have inclusion and but they just, yeah. yeah they're going to review it every six months so don't underestimate the amount of power that you all have the reason why usa swimming and fina came up with uh their rules which affirm you can sort of word it two different ways the way I like is you're going to affirm the girls and women's categories. These are female categories that we created them the same way we created a 120 pound weight class. This is how you qualify to participate. It's nobody's saying that you're not, not a woman, that you're not a transgender woman. Not nobody's saying that you should be denied employment or family law or public accommodations. Nobody's saying any of that, but in order to participate in women's sports um, that you, you need to be female. And, um, uh, and, um, and so the, the way that we were able to do it is exactly the kind of meeting that you all are having right here. As soon as the leadership heard from membership, like right as soon as USA Swimming heard from us is like, here's what we want. Because let me tell you, they are hearing from the trans rights folks. They are hearing from the Chris Mosier and the the um the um the far the people who just want full inclusion not even not even what leah did which is go on to gender affirming hormones but just be able to compete um it is a zero-sum game in that for every one transgender woman <clears throat> that takes the place of a biological woman right we we we, we already don't have enough opportunities we're already behind the game on giving women enough opportunities. You, we, we could, it, it, like, if I had like all of you helping me, we could easily start 150 new rowing teams around the country, easily. If I had you all, you know, right? We know how, we absolutely know how to do it. <clears throat> uh, but again, we're in a, we're, we're not in an equal position. It is a zero sum game. It's a, of all the college students, let me start with high school. High school students, it's about 60% of all high school students are an athlete. Okay, so that includes high school sports that is associated with the school. And that also includes the Olympic movement like you all, USA Rowing, or right, all the different sports. Okay, so <clears throat> between the two of them, 60%. Athletes are far more likely to go to college than non-athletes. So you would assume at least 60% of, of students are athletes. When you get to college, it is less than 3% of the student body is given a sports experience. So these are rare rationed types of educational opportunities that are 
invaluable that means so much for that person for the rest of their lives. Nancy, we have a question on um, where things are at the NCAA level and the Olympic level. What's the position? Right. So you all really do control. So I, I run a nonprofit called Champion Women. We got the swimming community together and we made the case. We used our Olympians, our Paralympians, and uh, our sport leaders. And I have to say, half men, half women were absolutely supportive of the women's category. Because again, we're so crazy, crazy close. Um, uh, so we were, we were able to do it. We, we introduced the best physicians, the best research, the best, right? And so they, they had a transparent process of who was getting on the committee, et cetera. And, um, and they, they had this trans right, that ended up in Budapina had to, in, ended up in Budapest and, um, and they won. So, okay, so we've got USA Swimming, okay? But what we don't have is the NCAA. So the NCAA, as soon as they heard that the science was all wrong and there was all this backlash of Leah breaking all these records that, that could be that maybe no other biological woman is able to break those records, those Ivy League records. The Ivy League is not a, <clears throat> you know, it's not, like swimming at University of Texas, or it's not a, a swimming powerhouse uh, type uh, school. And usually they're foregoing athletic scholarship in order to be able to go to the Ivy League. Um, in response to all the backlash, they said, we're gonna let national governing bodies like USA Rowing, let them determine what the rules are. So if your rules are right now, full inclusion, that would mean that it would be full inclusion in the NCAA. Um, so back then swimming did that. So they got on it and they again had this amazing process. And in a short order, they came up with an amazing process that says it's a two-step process. Uh, if a transgender woman wants to be able to compete First step is they had to have to show a committee and they named like the titles of who would be on the committee that they did not have an unfair advantage. I don't know how after somebody has been through male puberty that they're going to be able to show that, but they might be able to say that, you know, they didn't go through male puberty or they only went through for a year or something like that. After they pass, so they, they have, that is a very high hurdle that I doubt very many transgender athletes are going to be able to cross over right there. After that, then they have to show that they've been on gender affirming hormones for three years, and they have to be able to show that they've kept it down to a 2.5 nanomoles. <clears throat> um, I didn't share any of the science, and again, I, I shared uh, with uh, Jennifer and Anne what the what a lot of the science is, but the, the testosterone for men, excuse me, for women <clears throat> is between roughly 0.5 and 1.5. Like it's a spike that goes up and down. And then there's a giant gap. <clears throat> and then the, for men with considered low testosterone, it starts at about uh, just below eight. So you're going from 0.5 for females to eight for, right? It's like a 20, uh, it's a, a 20, men have 20 times more testosterone than women do. I always thought because I was, if you Google Nancy Hogshead muscle, you'll see like, huh, right? I, that I, I was really, really much. So I thought I had male levels of testosterone. Turns out, no, I do not. So um, then, uh, so if they could show that they had kept their testosterone way down, uh, into 2.5 and they would have to show that they had kept it down for three years. Um, then they would be able to compete in the female category, but it's a very tough test. So that's swimming's test. Um, and it follows the science and it follows fairness. You know, we say two things. One is there are three very important ideals in sport 
Uh, inclusion is a very important ideal. We spend so much money in swimming to try to make sure that people of color have opportunities in our sport. We're clearly not doing that well enough, but so inclusion, fairness, okay? So the whole doping and anti-doping uh, ideals and then uh, safety. So safety in the sport of swimming, it's not really that big of an issue. Uh, and we ask sport leaders to prioritize fairness. And um, as between those two, it's a, it's a zero sum game in, the, in terms of they're negatively correlated. So more of one is less of another. So the more inclusion you have, the less fairness you have. So as between those two, be honest about what it is that you're prioritizing and to prioritize fairness. We think that is a higher order goal. As somebody, so in my era, when I had to compete against the East Germans, <clears throat> um, um, I was always angry that the sport leaders weren't standing up for us. So here I was between ages of 14 to 22 and like, you know, I couldn't, you couldn't say anything in a press conference and I couldn't, I couldn't really, you know, talk to the media swimming world but it was utterly infuriating to know that somebody had an advantage that was going to be very difficult to surmount. And that just there was unfairness, just flat out unfairness. So I'm not saying that any transgender people are cheating, but they do ha absolutely have an unfair advantage. The, the, the scientists, the overwhelming, the, uh, uh, even, even, um, Joanna Harper is part of the Women's Sports Policy Working Group, and she, she uh, led one of the studies that I shared uh, with these two, and uh, she says it cannot be fair. Um, her, her, her next sentence would be, but it's meaningful competition. In other words, like as long as I guess transgender athletes aren't winning by too much, but it, is it meaningful competition? I don't know, like as a lawyer, you're looking for standards that are measurable or right, that you can, you know, like a weight category. You can, you know, people weigh in. Um, and and I, I just don't know if that's like, how do you measurable, measure whether or not there's meaningful competition? Like is somebody winning by too much? And anyway, it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, but anyway, there you go. Questions, questions, conversation. Nancy's Nancy. Oh, uh, I see Dale says, where do the LGBTQ rowing teams stand on this issue? It's interesting. They're, 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 uh, I, don't, I don't know what, I don't know about DC uh, strokes, but I do know that there are lots of trans, both transgender, gay, lesbian athletes who will say that it's about fairness and they recognize what the difference is. You know, like I'm in this weird world of one leg is in the civil rights world and that world wants full inclusion. <laughs> I've got another leg in the sports world and that world, particularly in swimming and track and field want fairness, right? So I, I'm like in between, you know, got these two worlds and I'm trying to, you know, make sure that they talk to each other but don't ever think that you all don't have the authority and the ability to make enormous changes out there. As I said, I'm, I'm happy, whatever you want me to facilitate, I'm happy to do. Um, yeah, Champion Women does uh, a lot of facilitating of, uh, we did everything from the athletes wanted to have an anonymous letter that got sent to, um, the Ivy League and to all the presidents and the athletic directors, and we did that for them. Um, we, uh, we, we got a Zoom meeting together with, uh, we had 250 people who were on the USA Swimming Board. We had lots and lots of Olympians um, who, and talked about strategy on what it was, you know, how is it, that, what were we gonna do with our sport? Um, so we, we do lots of that kind of thing. Okay, 
Um, in master's rowing, we use a lot of handicapping for age. Could handicaps be worked out for trans athletes? I don't see why not. I mean, as long as you're not taking a place, right? As long as there are extra lanes. In swimming, typically in, in, in the really good pools, it's a 10 lane pool and swimmers swim in eight of those lanes and usually nobody's in these last two lanes. So there's no reason why somebody couldn't be in lane nine. Um, but, but, but again, I want you to all to think about, it. it's a two-step process, okay? Step one is pretty cut and dry. Step two is really complex and it requires people who have very different ideas to come together. So step one is to lock down the boundaries of who's eligible to be able to compete in the girls and women's category. So that's fairly straightforward, number one. Um, and the, the only, there's a medical condition for those of you all that are science called androgen sensitivity syndrome. So there needs to be a way to make sure that if you're doing a cheek swab that you would be able to catch AIS people with, you can Google androgen sensitivity syndrome. That's the only sort of snafu, if you will. Um, and okay, so after you, so that's what swimming did. We're gonna lock this down. This category here is for females. And then the second one is, okay, how do we include? What, is it gonna be lane nine? Is it gonna be in lane nine? And we're, you know, typically the fastest seated swimmer swims in lane four. Would they, would, if they were the fastest seated swimmer, would they be in lane four? Um, would, uh, the way that um, uh, uh, USA tri or uh, I'm sorry, World Triathlon just decided that they were going to go with uh, having a women's category, a female category, and an open category. Um, Swimming FINA has said they're going to have a uh, a men's category, a women's category, and then an open category that would be transgender men, transgender women, non-binary, gender fluid. It would be open and anybody who like any, any um, you know, if a female or a male wanted to participate in this open category, they could. Um, they're still looking at what that is, right? But so, and, and it's the, the whole question is really different depending on how much contact is involved. World Rugby decided no transgender athletes because, uh, um, Males are seven inches taller on average than females and they weigh something like, right? So you just do like just the calculation, physics, mass, force. Women don't have nearly as strong necks and we have more of a certain kind of concussion that men don't get as much, which is when they, when they, uh, they get tackled and they fall back like that and their head hits back there. Um, and so, so because it was a concussion issue and they see concussions as like ruining the sport of rugby, they, they just said, no, that we just can't do it. You cannot have like a case by case basis. Um, I have a so, question. So, so, can, yeah, we go go back, can we go back to title nine, the change yeah, sure. of the, yeah. the regs, right? If, if, if. If the change is made to gender, um, how difficult is it to get that change back? What what what's your like? It's a new it's a new presidency. I, I th there's still a window that's open. So the the Biden administration said all these changes that they were going to make, ones that I agree with for the most part on you know the classroom and attendance and blah blah blah. Okay for transgender athletes, and they have withheld the information on sports. So if you all wanna get the, the rowing community going and right into the Department of Education, I've got all the addresses and the emails and the everything to let them know what you want. But remember, it's a two-step process. I cannot stress that enough. Right. What, what, what happens is I've seen people go through the thinking process a hundred times now. Step two is so complex that people throw up their hands and say like, oh, we can't do this. Okay. So 
And I used to think that I couldn't be in favor of a state statute that protected the girls and women's category because it wasn't doing step two. And I had to change my mind on that. I had to come around and say that, um, that, that, okay, they're doing step one and they will get to step two. Particularly, I mean, the transgender, the, the number of kids and people that are saying that they are tra non-binary, transgender, and uh, gender fluid is just skyrocketing. Of course, there, I, there is no such thing as a women's sports advocate that is not also a sports advocate. They, they just don't exist. Those two things are the same, right? We believe in the importance of sports for kids. So of course we want opportunities, but just not in the women's category. Uh, I, I uh, see Marie asks, it's my understanding that transgender doesn't necessarily define that they have transitioned, meaning surgery or hormones, but that they identify as the opposite sex. Is that true? That's true. So Biden's, his regulations that would equate sex discrimination with gender identity discrimination, whoop, it would do, you know, have those two things would absolutely, um, um, apply to somebody who five minutes ago said, I identify as female. I mean, Wimbledon's going on right now and the prize money is $4 million. And do you think that there's not somebody out there? Like, I, I don't think it's gonna happen in mass, right? That like thousands of people are gonna pretend, but do I, but like, I mean, I've been involved in elite sport all of my life and the lengths that people will go to to cheat. Um, I was very involved. I testified in Congress in uh, 1999 to make sure that WADA and USADA got started and got funded. And people taking syringes and putting urine in their bladders that was clean. I mean, people don't know um, people who are not in sport don't appreciate what crazy things people will do in order to win. And I say that as somebody who would have done, who wasn't going to cheat or wasn't going to break any rules, but, you know, who left college, who um, went into enormous debt, who did nothing but train for a year and a half, who... Um, uh, you know, I, you know, social life and life skills and whatnot, right? All postponed. Uh, did not, never had a single job until uh, I had finished my my swimming career. Um, right. So, so I know how hard people are willing to work, what they're willing to do, what they're willing to give up, and uh, you know, four million dollars at the end of that. And then you can revert right afterwards. Before we wrap up, I just want to in interject something that Donna Lopiano, who is, look her up, she's, she's an icon also. You know, the answer is not, you know, should there be numbers um, that enter our category? I mean, the answer is not to have us drug to come up the testosterone level. That, that's just not an ethical thing. Um, to have to put our girls through, right? To make them feel that that's the only way they're going to be able to compete and win. So, you know, there are a lot of issues. Uh, there are a lot of issues and I'm a referee, you know, I'm, I'm in rowing. It's like safety and fairness are number one. And then that's going to put us uh, in, in, in an untenable position. What do we do? You know, what is fair? Um, it's just... There's just a lot of, a lot of tentacles and then coaching education and, you know, how do you, you know, I know there's in Boston, there's a club in Boston right now with high school kids that are experiencing these issues. And, and a lot of the young girls are afraid to speak up. And oh, in rowing in Seattle, Oregon, no, I mean, sorry, Washington state, 
Oregon, and California. So we have to, you know, there, there has to be some measure of, of wisdom that comes into how our sport's going to move forward. And, you know, if hopefully this was help, helpful a little bit, at least to bring some uh, light to the issue, it's there, right? It, it's going to, it's probably going to accelerate, but definitely, you know, if you can take 40 minutes to listen to Ross Tucker's presentation on the science, um, so that you you can formulate your own opinion, right? So, Jen. No, I just wanted to thank and thank you for bringing this uh, subject to women of the row and friends. Um, and Nancy, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, your passion certainly shines through, and we appreciate you putting the time and energy into you know, kind of giving us a glimpse into the subject and giving us the resources to, you know, to, to further educate ourselves about, you know, what's happening and, um, you know, how we, how we can, how we can help going forward, whatever that path may be. And if any, if anybody here ever wants to, you know, talk about it, I'm open to speaking. Yes. <laughs> Uh, Janet, I see that you have your hand up. Do you want to say something before we break? Nancy, I just want you to know that in the early 70s, there are a lot of us in the Philadelphia area that worked very hard. Kathy Rush was very involved back then, and we were all working very hard. So there is a lot of frustration on those of us who came out of the 60s and the early 70s and were really trying to change how college sport was operating so kudos to you thank you yeah no thank you i mean you know i i was the beneficiary of so i just turned 60 the women who are like 75 right now so donna lopiano donna deverona who else the, the, the whole group over there they like wrapped their arms around me and gave me professional opportunities and um, yeah, really feel very grateful and fortunate to be able to be in this field. But I, yeah. I have, I, I, I know the shoulders I stand on. I, I, there, I, I just found some, I, 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 like I said, I wrote the book, right? Um, and I was just doing a, a something with, um, I think it was National Coalition for Women and Girls in Education. And it was like a whole new subset of people who talked about what the, what the fights were to be able to get those 1975 regulations passed. And uh, I, right, I didn't even, I mean, they're like, this group was like 85, um, you know, right? But you're, the, the number of feminists that it has taken for us to be able to get as far as we have is astounding. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank thank you all for joining us tonight. I mean, looking around at these names and faces, I know it's a, pow a pretty powerful group of women and um, women the and men that um, you know want the best and you know and struggle with this topic. So we thank you for being here tonight. Um, reach out to Nancy. Okay. Reach out to and Anne. I yeah, I would be remiss if I, I didn't say our COOs on here is we need money. Like we were not expecting champ, uh, Leah Thomas at the beginning of the year. We had a totally different year planned. <laughs> um, no, yeah, we need money. So championwomen.org, you can give. There's lots of ways to give uh, with transactionless. You know, you don't have to pay anything. Great. So thank you Great. very much. Thanks for thank this you, opportunity. Nancy. We appreciate it. You all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye, everybody. Good night.